Okay, I'm very excited to have on the Goldstein on Geld Show, Professor Elroy Dimson from the Cambridge Judge Business School. He also just came out with a book, Financial Market History, which at the end of today's show, he's going to tell you how you can actually get this $40 book for free. But Elroy, I'm very excited to have you because one of the things that I know you talk about and you are a real expert in is the history of the market. And one of the things that, that people often look at is what's called factor investing, if they're trying to make a lot of money in investing. Let's start by explaining what is factor investing? Factor investing involves focusing on getting exposure of your portfolio to a variety of factors which differ from what people looked at traditionally. So to explain it, let me just give you the traditional background. First people looked at stocks and bonds. Then they looked, for example, at stocks in different countries. Then people naturally also talked about industries. The modern approach is one which emphasizes factors which are different from industries. Uh, by factors, what we mean is sensitivity to inflation or whether companies are small or large or have a high or a low dividend yield. These different attributes have a very important impact on how an investor's portfolio performs. So, for example, a company, there might be several companies that people would normally buy in different industries, but you're saying instead of looking at just different industries, look at how these companies might react to a change in, in the interest rate environment, like utility companies or real estate companies? Yes, but it's not simply a question of fundamental analysis of how a particular company will react. Factor investors look at exposure to these different influences. So they will focus across many industries and, and possibly across many markets on whether they are tilted towards small cap or large cap investments or towards companies which sell at a low stock price relative to fundamental attributes like dividends or a high stock price. There are lots of these different factors and they're becoming very important in the way people think about investing. This sounds to me like what we would refer to as fundamental analysis, meaning you're looking at a company based on, let's say, its price to earnings ratio or its, its uh, price to book ratio or the amount of debt that it has. Am I narrowing in on factor investing or is it actually different? You're uh, walking there, not running towards it, Doug, uh, <laughs> because I think the way you're articulating this is you choose a particular industry and then say, do I want a higher or low dividend yield? The factor investor will look at whether they want high yielding or low yielding stocks or small or large stocks or quality companies or non-quality. And then within that, they may look at questions like what industry is that taking me into? So, so this would go, wait, let me, let me, let me die. I, the first example you gave was someone might look that he wants to invest in dividend paying stocks. So there certainly are investors who focus on dividend paying stocks or dividend growth stocks. Now am I getting closer to factor investing? Yeah, you're getting closer. And some, <laughs> okay. some of those uh, investors may think in quite traditional terms, but may nevertheless have a factor exposure. So uh, you've really touched on a very important issue at present. Many investors are preoccupied with how they can create income in a world where income levels are disappointingly low compared to when they first started investing. Mm -hmm. So if they go for high dividend stocks, they may accidentally be taking a factor exposure. If you did this five or 10 years ago, you would have been on an upswing. In most countries, high dividend yield stocks have performed well. But people are very keen on them. So it may be the case that prices have been pushed to such a level that there could be an across the board collapse in high yielding stocks. And so you would then have been caught out by a factor exposure that instead of working for you, worked against you. So what would be another factor exposure other than let's say dividend yield? Well, I think size is, is a, a classic one. If you go back to the 1980s, that was the point at which people discovered the small firm effect, the size effect. This was a tendency validated on US data for small companies to give a higher stock market return than large companies. Nowadays, that would not be at the top of people's lists of regularities in the stock market. But for a long time, it seemed like a puzzling anomaly that you got rewarded and rewarded generously for tilting your portfolio towards small companies. Nowadays, I think you would anticipate in the long run to get some reward for doing that, but it's more modest than people would have been talking about a few decades ago. 
But it's a classic example. If you tilt your portfolio towards small caps, there are periods where small caps do much better and there are periods when small caps do much worse than large companies. So in doing that, you've taken a factor exposure. And I think slightly closer to traditional investing is the notion that factor investing is a little bit like investors who invest according to a theme. And you could have a theme of favoring small caps because you think that over the course of uh, 2018, 2019, that uh, small companies will do better than large companies or the opposite. We're talking with Professor Elroy Dimson from the Cambridge Judge Business School. His most recent book is Financial Market History. It just came out in the beginning of the year. At the end of the show, we'll tell you how you can get a copy of that for free. Of course, you could go to Amazon and pay $40 to buy the book. Elroy, one of the things you're talking about is, as you're describing what factor investing is all about, is you keep mentioning things that happened in the past. Now, my day job is that I'm a financial advisor, and all the time clients come in and they want to develop portfolios, and they look and they say, well, Doug, you know, show me how this fund or this manager did last year, and they kind of assume that it's going to happen again, and I always have to warn them, and I say, wait a second, past performance is no guarantee of future returns. How much can people actually learn from looking at the past performance of markets in order to make wise decisions about what to do in the future? Look, it's a really difficult job you've got. Mine's probably easier. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) Thank you. But uh, (laughs) what you would like to deliver to your clients is predictions of the future. You would like to know what will happen. What I've been talking about is factors that will influence return so that uh, if people want to take a bet, as it were, on the performance of uh, well-managed or poorly managed companies or high-yielding or low-yielding companies, that they know that there are some common factors. Can you outguess them? I think that's really tough. But some of them are ones which, for a long-term investor, ought to provide some sort of reward. So let me go back to a couple of the examples that I've given you earlier. One is that small companies ought to sell for less than otherwise similar large companies. They are a nuisance to have a portfolio of small companies with a market capitalization the same as one large company involves a lot of bother and a lot of monitoring. They'll also be illiquid, so they will be more costly to trade. People won't pay as much for stocks that are unmarketable, illiquid. They will therefore sell for lower prices, and if they sell for lower prices, you expect their return over the long term to be higher. So there can be some kind of logic behind all of this, but mostly what we're seeing is exposures where one can form a view about whether there will be a reward in the long run, not about whether performance will be good this week, this quarter, this year, the next three years, which I think many of your clients want you to provide in your day <laughs> job. Well, when you say long term, what is your, what, what's your time frame for long term? You know, the if you look at the adverts for uh, mutual funds, they'll cite a particular period. You shouldn't be investing in mutual funds unless you've got a five-year horizon, for example. But there is no date at which you would expect to win with uh, um, investment strategies. It only gets to be more probable as you take a longer horizon. And so for people who are saving for future generations, then uh, that is seriously long-term. I spent quite a long time as chair of the Strategy Council for the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund. That's there, at least for the next century. That's a long (laughs) way out. But if you were talking about uh, investing money for your uh, young son's bar mitzvah or your your teenage daughter's wedding, that's Mm -hmm. a risky thing to do unless you really are willing to suffer the downside It's because there's a possible downside that securities should be expected to give you some reward for risk rather than simply hanging on to cash. Yeah, that's true. We certainly hope for the reward. And I think that's critical what you're saying is that a lot of times people assume that if they have a more aggressive portfolio, they're going to make more money. And I would say it doesn't mean that. It just means that your portfolio is more aggressive. You could make more money. 
And it, it's not that it's a given that, uh, that you know, high risk is high reward. It's that high risk does give you the potential, but it also gives you the potential for high risk and actually losing money. You know, Elroy, I know that you cover a lot of this in your writing and you appear in, in many, many places on the web. Unfortunately, we're just about out of time now. So tell me in the last few seconds, how can people follow you and follow your work? Well, if you Google for me, you'll find my CV, like other academics. There's a website and the Vita. And a failing of academics is that it's actually <laughs> awfully easy to find out their email address. So I'm not going to read that out for you, but uh, uh, I'm happy to uh, correspond with people up to a point. But also, this recent book of ours has achieved astonishing success. A huge number of copies distributed and, uh, uh, and also of electronic copies downloaded. The book is called Financial Market History. It has the subtitle for Reflections on the Past for Investors Today, and it's published by the CFA Institute's Research Foundation. If you look in most countries on Amazon, you'll find that Financial Market History is available for the $40 or the equivalent in other countries that you mention. And in a remarkably generous act, the CFA Institute have also ensured that you can acquire the PDF if you go to their own website or on Amazon. You can get the Kindle version completely free of charge, along with instructions as to how to download software for your machine so that even if you don't have a Kindle, you can read that on your own iPad or PC. So it's Financial Market History, and it's edited by David Chambers and Elroy Dimson. Fantastic. We will put a link to that at the show notes of today's show at goldsteinongelt.com to make it easy for people to find the book and to find you. Professor Elroy Dimson, thanks so much for taking the time. It's been my pleasure. You've been listening to the Goldstein on Gelt show with money maven, Doug Goldstein. Check out all of Doug's money ideas at goldsteinongelt.com. Doug specializes in helping people who live outside the United States handle their U.S. investment accounts. If you have a question that you would like answered on the air or off, contact Doug at his website or send him an email to doug at profile-financial.com. 